All right, you may be seated, and if you would like to open up to 2 Peter 3 and 9, that's where we're going to begin. Every scripture that we talk about today, we're not going to look up, but I will give you references, and you will be able to look them up on your own time, which I highly encourage you to do that. So our primary thought today is going to be focusing in on the mercies of God. Number one, we want to understand the mercies of God. And in 1 Peter 3 and 9, Peter says this to the, in the letter that he wrote to different believers. He said, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So I believe right there we begin to see a picture forming. When Peter's talking to the men, he's talking to women, he's talking to the believers that are going to receive this letter, and he says, I want to remind you of something. I want to remind you that in reference to Jesus returning, in reference to things ending on earth, I want you to know that he is not slack in keeping his promises. The reason things seem to be delayed, the reason it seems like it's not coming quick enough and Jesus hasn't returned quick enough, one of the reasons is because he suffers a long time to word each person. He does not want one single person to perish or to go into darkness or to end up in hell, but he wants every single person to be given the opportunity to change their heart toward him, to change their mind toward him, and to change the direction that they're going in life from him to him. So then we think, well, then why would God send if he doesn't want one person to perish? Why would he send one person to hell? Well, in Matthew 25 and 41, it's elaborating on hell. And here's what it says. It says that in, it talks about hell being an everlasting fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. So I want you to make this note. I think this is really important for you. It's important for you to understand that God never made hell for one human being. God never intended for one human being to ever end up in hell. Hell was prepared strictly and solely for the devil and for his angels. Never was a man supposed to go there. It's not God's will that any man go there. As a matter of fact, God said, I'm going to suffer a long time. And we're going to talk about the type of suffering he does and what's actually taking place when he uses that word long suffering or suffering a long time to word men. There's another verse, and I think the prophet does an amazing job. You can read it on your own time, but it's in Isaiah 5. And the prophet is speaking the oracles of God. He is speaking as if it were God himself. And he begins to talk and he begins to say to all the people, you know, he said God wanted a vineyard. God planted a huge, huge vineyard and that vineyard is the world, it's the people. And then he went on and said he picked his choice vine. And he set his choice vine in the vineyard. And not only did he place his choice vine in the vineyard, which we know to be Jesus, but we know that he also built a tower in that vineyard. And we know the vineyard to be the church. And not only did he build a tower in the vineyard, but he also put a wine press in the vineyard, which is a type of the Holy Spirit. And all he was trying to say is he's simply communicating to the people. And at the end of saying, I just wanted a vineyard. I just wanted a vineyard. I just wanted a place where people could walk with me and I could walk with people. I just wanted them to know I love them and I care about them. And I'll go any distance for them. And they're important to me. And I'll lay my life down for them. As a matter of fact, I picked my choice vine 
my son Jesus, and I sent him into the vineyard. And not only did I send him into the vineyard to tell the people that I love them and do miracles and healings and intervene into their life and change their world for them, I set the church in the vineyard. And the church became a light shining in a dark place. And it began to say to everybody, I love them. And not only did I set the church in the vineyard, but I sent the Holy Spirit, the wine press, to be available to minister to every person. And then this is what he says. This is what Isaiah says. He's speaking on behalf of God, and he says, what more could I do? What more can I do for people? What more can I do for people? I don't want them to perish. I suffer long towards them. I simply made a vineyard so they would enjoy me and I could enjoy them. And I sent my choices vine. What more can I do for them? I sent them the Holy Spirit. I provided a wonderful fellowship for them. What more could I possibly do for the people? And then he begins to explain to us what he does for the people in Romans chapter 1. So I'd like you to turn there to verse 18. A little quiet in this house. Okay, Romans verse chapter 1 and verse 18. We're going to read the entire way through this, and then I'll go back and touch on it. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. So there is a present-day wrath in action today. We're going to show you what that is. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they, each and every person in this vineyard, are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God, nor did they give him thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. Their foolish hearts was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of an incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over again to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural and in the same way also. The men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desires toward one another. Men with men commit, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own person the due penalty of their error. I want you to notice that there's an amazing picture being painted by Paul trying to explain to you who your father is. It begins by saying there's a present day wrath in action today. It's the wrath of God being demonstrated in the earth. What is that wrath? Is that wrath lightning bolts coming down from heaven? Is that wrath God getting exhausted with some of you after you pushed button after button and consist, continued to say, I don't care about you, God? No, that wrath is really, really simple. It begins by God saying, I want you to rest assured in this, that be it in the United States of America, be it in Canada, be it on the most remote island in the world, be it in the Himalayan mountains where only a handful of people may live. I want you to know that I have made it evident to every single person that I am God and I am alive. I want you to know not only have I made it evident to them, I've made it evident within them. After all, I'm God. 
After all, not only am I making myself evident to every single person, but all of creation, it sings an amazing song of my divine attributes and my, my power in my nature. It forever testifies to every single person that I'm alive, that I'm for people, that I'm not against them. I made this amazing world that people have studied for thousands of years and they still can't figure it out. But here's what happens. You have to see God with his arms extended out and every human on the earth being held within the boundaries of his own arms. And he's holding them. And he's holding them. And he constrains them with his love. And he cares about them. And he pours his goodness out on them, both the just and the unjust. He reaches. He reveals. He makes himself known. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He suffers a long time. So as man resists him and begins to push up against his arms and say, let me go. Let me go. I want to do what I want to do. Let me go. I'm not doing it that way. I don't care about the tower. I don't care about the church. I don't care about the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let me go. I want what I want, and I'm going to do what I want to do. The Bible said God gives him over. He opens his arms up. He opens his arms. You see, the mercy constrains him, but his wrath says, I'm never going to make you love me. Never going to make you serve me. You don't want to come? Don't come. And so when we push and we push and we resist and we oppose and we push down what is evident within us, finally, God says, okay, you can have your way. But thank God it's not all over at that point. He just extends his arms out further like Stretch Nelson and he wraps him back around you. It's just that each time he does it, you kind of go downhill to a deeper, darker place inside yourself. And where you once worshipped the creator, now the creation becomes more important than the creator. Where you once had normal relationships with women and women, women and men and men and women, now it's women and women and men and men. And he says we get darker in our understanding. We get darker. And the problem is, is the mercies of God are holding us because the harder our heart gets, we'll come to a place where we'll lift our fists to God and say there is no God. And it doesn't come overnight. It comes because of the resistance, just the little thing. Anybody been a parent? Did you ever have your your kid resist and resist and resist and resist? It's like devastating to your heart. There's nothing more devastating and painful than to see ahead what's awaiting your child and them saying, no, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. I'm going this way. This is what I want. Nothing more tragic. And God holds us and holds us and holds us. And when we read this, he's talking about the world. But the next chapter, he says he changes his direction and he begins to talk about the house of God and the church. And he said, you know, you guys do the same thing. You don't do the things they do maybe, but you resist the same way. And the mercies of God say, I'll hold you, I'll hold you, I'll hold you. And I think many of us have experienced our resistance and our push. And what's happened is, finally, he let you have what you wanted, but it wasn't what we wanted. And thank God that we were rescued. Thank God that he didn't give up on us. Thank God that his mercies are new every morning. Thank God that he extends his hands out there. But but what more could he do? What more can he do? What more can he do for you? What more can God do? He sent his choicest vine to you. 
He put the house of God in your midst and brought you here. He gave you the Holy Spirit and he's making himself known to you. And he's making himself evident within you. What more can he do? And we want to say, God, you didn't do this. What more can he do for you? Is it possible that maybe our challenges and our difficulties are because of us resisting? It is a comfort to my heart to believe that every human person that's ever been born, God has made himself evident within them and has made himself known to them. It is a comfort. How do you know that's true? Well, the only evidence I have is the Bible, but how do you know it's not true? What authority do you have to prove that it's not true? As a matter of fact, he got to you and you and you and you and you. God, how he got to you, I don't know. And you and you and you. He was like on level seven, man. God kept giving him over and giving him over and giving him over. But you know what? He's a faithful servant of the Most High God today. Amen. So I think before we talk about hell, we should understand the mercies of God a little bit and understand how God works with people. And I guess I want to say to you, I want to, I want to somehow press upon you, what more can he do for you? Can we begin to soften our hearts to the things of God, to the great things of God? Could we begin to allow eternity to be our filter in the decisions that we make? If I have to suffer, that's okay. If I have to pay a little price, it's for Jesus. It's not all about you and it's not all about me. Number two, let's talk about the devastation of hell. Matthew 25 and 41 says that this punishment of hell is everlasting. It was ever and strictly intended for no one but the devil and his angels. Isaiah 5 and 14 says hell has been enlarged by itself because of the people that are going there that were never intended to be there. It has enlarged itself to swallow up and consume the people that are going there that were never intended to be there. Matthew 13 and 50 talks about hell and says it's a place where there's a furnace of fire where there's welling and gnashing of teeth. Mark 9 and 47 talks about being cast into hell fire where the worm does not die. That means not only is a person going to be burning in hell for eternity and they, as we saw in our first lesson when we said there is, there is a life after death. We saw that that rich man in hell had his five senses intact. Matter of fact, his body was intact because he said, could Lazarus please put his finger in a drop of water and just touch the tip of my tongue? And so we see that this fire that burns in hell is an eternal fire that will consume you, but you don't burn up. You feel it. You experience it. It never ceases to burn. How could God do that? Why would God send anybody to hell? God has sent nobody to hell and never will send anybody to hell. God has made a way through Jesus Christ. He sent his choices fine to every person and made it evident within them and made it evident to them. God will send no one to hell. If a man goes to hell, he chooses to. A worm that never dies, it crawls through you day and night forever and ever and ever and ever and eats away at you and you feel it and you experience it. There's a word named Hades in the New Testament that describes hell. And each time it uses the word hell, it talks about mental torment. It's a picture of mental torment, of mental distress. that never stops. 
that never stops. If we think there's mental distress down here, if we think we've had some mental challenges down here, we've not begun to see what, we're, what, what, what will be faced when people cross over from this dimension to the next dimension and they end up in an eternal damnation, in eternal hell because they did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's what you believe that determines your destination. It's what you do that determines your reward or your compensation. You're not here just to eat beanie weenies and ramen noodle surprise, folks. You're not here just to watch the football show or to make enough money to pay your bills. That's why you're going to have to learn to filter everything through eternity because your time here is a preparation for eternity. The Bible's very clear. Jesus looked at every man and said, you are to lay up a treasure for yourself in heaven. You are to lay up a treasure for yourself in heaven. You are to lay up a treasure for yourself in heaven. Some people say, well, I'm not interested rested in having a treasure in heaven what well, Jesus said you are to lay up a treasure for yourself in heaven because if you do it forces you to filter your decisions and how you live and the things you do and how you treat people and how you use your gifts it forces you to filter them through eternity instead of just you that's why he wants you to lay up a treasure I don't want to get up there and God say, well, we'll talk about that in our last week together. We're going to talk about heaven, what it's really like. We're going to talk about standing at the Bema seat of Christ, which is the seat of judgment. But the judgment that is to be, is to be afforded there is not a damnation, but rather a reward. And so it should be a time of jubilee. It should be a time of excitement it should be a time of joy and uh and you know i like heaven because it says that heaven is full of books and my wife loves heaven because she got more books than anyone in this church does and uh and it says it's full of books and in those books are written all your deeds both good and bad and you'll be rewarded now the good news is if you have bad deeds guess what if they're blotted out by the blood of jesus you got you're going to have a lot of empty pages in your book but hey, I don't care if I got thousands of empty pages. They're going to say, they're going to say, bring Pastor Tony's books down, and he's going to say, get the crane, <laughs> get the crane, and they open them up, blot it out, blot it out, blot it out. Laid his life down, traveled into the mountains of Nicaragua. Lived up there, couldn't sleep at night, laid his life down for these men and women, went the extra mile, and it's going to be reward after reward after reward after reward. It's going to be a time of celebration and jubilee. It, we're going to have forever and eternity and never run out of time, never ever run out of time to be rejoicing in God. Those of us that have been faithful in the little things, God will give us greater things. You'll be rewarded openly if you've done things secretly. You know, that's why the Bible said when you give, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing because your Father who sees in secret will that day reward thee openly. So don't always tell everybody everything you do because that's your reward. If, if you go and tell everybody and they say, way to go, make them jump higher and shout louder because you lost that reward in heaven. <laughs> There's a word called geh Gehana. It's again another Greek word that's used for hell. Um <clears throat> The word came from the idea, number one, in concept, that there was a valley called the Valley of Hinnon. And in this valley, in this valley, it, it became a common receptacle for all the refuse of the city. It's on the south side of Jerusalem, 
and there's a fire forever burning down there. It never ceases to burn. And they use this concept and this idea to promote the idea of hell because it was the refuse of the city that was thrown there and it would burn and it never would cease to burn. And it was a picture in the natural world to people in those days of hell. As a matter of fact, many, many scholars believe that the wicked kings in the Old Covenant, you can read about them in Second Chronicles 28, the wicked kings would offer up their children and the children of the kingdom up to false gods, the god of, god of Molech. And it's believed that in this place, in Gihana, where this fire would burn night and day, it was believed that they would bring their children that they were going to sacrifice to the god of Moloch, and they would force them to walk into the fires, and they would beat them and whip them, and as they did, there would be welling and gnashing of teeth and crying. And that's where Jesus borrowed that thought and borrowed that idea in the New Testament. It's a place you'd never want to go. There's only one thing you have to do to stay out of hell, and that's believe. You see, it's what you believe that determines your destination. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. It doesn't say do, and you shall be saved. It says believe. Only believe. That thief on the cross that was wicked had lived an ungodly life and was being crucified because he was wicked and ungodly, and he he terrorized the community. One second before he died, Jesus said, Today, you'll be with me in paradise because he believed, not because he did anything right. I mean, what did he have to say was good about his life? Nothing. And so, first and foremost, make sure you believe. And then secondarily, your family, your friends, your work center. Never underestimate why you're there. You're not part of the Stanick family, Scott, just because you were born by mom and dad Stanick. No, sir, you were sent by God. You were brought forth into that family for such a time as this. It's important for you, Scott, to filter what you do through me because everybody's watching you. It's important that they see that Jesus Christ is a real person, that he really talks to you, he really walks with you. People, are, people have given up virtually on spirituality in many, many ways because they don't see a reality in it. But God is real. He talks to us. He walks with us. I wanted to do one thing this today before we left. Really would like to pray a prayer over those of you who feel it's necessary to answer this. But when I was putting this together and I was listening and I was watching and I was talking to God and I was saying, God, is there anything you want to do at the end? He said, oh, there sure is. You know, and at first I thought I want to tell everybody to go get everybody else saved because we don't want anyone to go to hell. But what he really said to me is he said, Scott, he said, I want you to pray over the people that know that they agree with and constantly deal with stubborn resistance to my spirit ministering to them. What do I mean? I mean like when you're about to turn the TV station on and the Spirit of God says, don't watch that. Or when he says, hey, why are you yelling at your child like that? Or, sir, why are you talking so harsh to your wife? Is that necessary? These are the things that God wants to get into your life. It's not about quitting these things. It's about softening the heart so that we can walk with God, so that we can show the people in the world around us that we're not mere human beings. We walk with God. We sure do. God talks to us. He tells us stuff. We can lay hands on sick people. We watch them get healed. And so I'm going to ask you if you'll just close your eyes for a moment. 
And if you know in your heart, I'm not talking about you had a bad day. I'm talking about, you know, you run a cycle where there's a consistent resistance to the things of God. Maybe it's not in every year. Maybe you love God when it comes to worship and lifting your hands. But if he said, hey, can you give me 10 cents? You're like, oh, no, no, don't touch my money, bless God. You, it could be many, many different areas. But you know you. And I believe God said there's an anointing here to do something inside of the heart of people. And soften us up in such a way where we won't find ourselves teetering on the fence of heaven or hell. But we'll know that we know that we know that we're going to heaven and that we walk with God. And we're not resisting and getting harder and harder and harder. Are you with me? All right, so I'm just going to ask you, if you know in your heart it's an area God has been dealing with you on, I'm going to, and listen to me, I'm talking to you teenagers with your mom and dad. What more can they do for you? I said to my kids all the time, what more could I do for you? What more could I do for you? And I would list endless, endless, endless things. What more could I do for you? Don't you ever dishonor me. I've never dishonored you. Never dishonor me. Never dishonor me. I gave you the best that you could ever get from me. You owe me to honor me. And my kids are like, okay, Dad. I believe that. So I'm going to ask you just to slip your hand up if you know that you, anybody at all. I appreciate you being willing to do that. It's a hard thing to answer to, but who cares? Like, I want to be, I want to be free. I was thinking maybe I should just lay hands on myself. I could use a little bit of help. You know, I get a little stubborn with my wife sometimes. Anybody still do that? I hate stubbornness. It's such a devil that hurts people's lives. They just persist in a stubborn way and they persist in error that brings nothing but destruction because they won't listen to others and to God. Come on up front if that's you. We're going to just pray. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lay hands on each of you. I'm just going to pray over you. And we're going to believe by faith that something breaks today. Amen. Father, I pray over each person here, Father, that there would come an assistance and a shift and a change upon our hearts that we would hate it. We would hate resistance. We would hate stubbornness. We would not glory in it. We would not like it. We would not be proud of no one's telling me what to do. And then I pray, Father, over each heart right now that there would be a touch from heaven. And I take authority over rebellion stubborn resistance you foul unclean devil in the name of Jesus I rebuke you from every heart I rebuke that generation curse that some people were born with I rebuke I rebuke you in the name of Jesus loose them 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 in the name of Jesus. And I pray you put people in their lives to help coach them. Amen. Let's sing this song again and then after that they all can come up.